Well, while we're uh, our panelists and moderators are making uh, their way up to the stage, let me uh, begin the introductions. Uh, the next panel, which is going to be discussing developing a skilled STEM workforce, will be moderated by Professor Mark Hoffman. Uh, Professor Hoffman is the Deputy Vice Chancellor Academic and VP at the University of Newcastle, and he will be joined um, on the panel by Professor Katrina Fulka, who is the Executive Dean, Faculty of Science at Engineering and Technology, University of Adelaide. Uh, uh, Professor Katrina is a top 100 innovator, completely transforming computer science education. Her work directly addresses inequities in access to technology, helping to build a fair Australia. Uh, they'll be joined by Professor Brian Uwe, uh, who's the head of School of uh, Civil Engineering at the University of Sydney. Uh, Professor Uwe is an international authority on steel and composite structures. His research covers all facets of building and bridge construction, seeking more efficient, safer designs while moving closer to net zero emissions. Uh, next, we have on the panel Professor uh, Nasser Khalili. Uh, Nasser is the Head of uh, Civil and Environmental Engineering at the University of New South Wales and Director of the ARC Industry Transformation Research Hub for Resilient and Intelligent Infrastructure Systems. Uh, Professor Nasser is an international leader in geotechnical engineering, computational geomechanics, and unsaturated soil mechanics. His work encompasses roads, tunnels, mines, dams, and groundwater projects. Uh, next on the panel is Janine Herzig. Uh, she's the executive president and director um, and, uh, of CEC International. Uh, Janine is a metallurgical engineer with 30 years experience in, re in the resources sector, in community relations, and ESG. She has inspired, mentored, developed uh, countless young professionals, facilitated career roadshows, university and high school engagements, and community outreach. And last but not least, Professor Thas Nirmalathalas, um, who is the Deputy Dean Research of the Faculty of Engineering and Information Technology at the University of Melbourne. Uh, Professor Thas is an expert in communication technologies and networking for optical distribution of broadband wireless signals. He's an academic lead at the Wireless Innovation Lab, an industry university collaboration vehicle aiming to improve accessibility of ultra-fast wireless communications throughout Australia uh, through next generation wireless solutions. Over to you, Mark. Thanks very much, Fina. You might ask why have we got so a combination of IT and civil engineers here? <laughs> Uh, today. The topic is developing a skilled STEM workforce. And if you look over the skill shortages in Australia at the moment, what comes to the top consistently is IT and communications, construction and the resources sector. So this group is particularly well placed to actually address these, these issues. Now, in the report which was launched, the ATSI, essentially the ATSI policy document which was launched this morning, the final and probably most important recommendation was, and I'll, I'll quote, to raise the profile of STEM careers in Australia to showcase their attractiveness and accessibility. And so I'm going to pass the first question to the panel. How do we go about raising the profile, particularly in, across the community, of, of the opportunities and impact which STEM careers actually provide to our society? And I'll start firstly here with Katrina. Thanks, Mark. Um, so I'm gonna, I was really excited by the previous panel's conversation, so I'd like to continue a little bit mm. of that sense in a, in, in a way of, of focusing on that supply aspect, because I think a critical aspect of raising the profile of STEM careers, of, uh, of, of building awareness of exactly what STEM careers are and where they can take people sits in, in our schools and our teachers. And, it was very interesting, the conversation that Anne and Mark had around, well, we can't tear down our education system. No, we can't. But we, are, we have reached a point, I think, where the need for STEM careers, the push to have STEM awareness, digital literacy across our community is so critical that we do need to make some step changes in the way that we invest and support our education sector. 
You know, at the moment we have just over 300,000 teachers in Australia. And I think it's roughly 20% of those have some kind of tertiary qualification in STEM. One of five of those won't even be teaching in STEM in their school. So we have a massive issue in terms of actually getting people who have really strong STEM awareness in a position where they're talking with our next generation of STEM innovators, where they're talking with parents, where they're talking with community around what those STEM careers are. 80% of Australian students, I think it is, will have a mathematics education teacher who has no major or specialisation in mathematics. If you compare that to the international average, that's 46%. So we're not setting our next generation up well to have that awareness of STEM careers. I've spent the last 10 years working with Australian teachers across Australia in helping them build computer science awareness and, and, and skill base. And we've had a really strong focus in the work that we've done on working with remote regional communities, low SES communities, schools with high Indigenous enrolment. And when I'm working with those schools, they have issues and they don't even have reliable Wi-Fi access in their school. So providing you know, online resources, providing all of the materials that we have so many selections of, which is a, another problem that the report talks to, doesn't actually help a lot of our schools if we don't put the investment in to give them the resources, the basic internet access, but also all of the STEM-based equipment that they need and the support for our teachers to build that skill base. So for me, that is the critical step that we need to, to, to address. Thanks very much. I might pass down to the, to the end to Tass. What do, you, what do you think in this regard? Yeah, I think yeah, the STEM has a very diversity of careers, and I think that's not really understood at the, really at the supply end, as Katrina was talking about. The STEM workforce, you know, all the way from innovators in startup, all the way to the deep scientists and engineers in the field, that you know, diversity of career pathways is not well understood at the high school. And as a result, our students are not really exposed to what is the, really the pathway. I think what we should be doing is to really communicate the evolution of these STEM career pathways. It is not stereotyped into a scientist or an engineer because they actually go through the evolution of organizations in changing their roles from a deep tech role to marketing and business and customer relationship, and even running corporations. So I think that uh, challenge is it because people don't see that linear career, you know, the progression of the career and then not being able to articulate to students what other career options are. The other thing I guess is, is also a major challenge is in, as Katrina pointed out, it's the career advice that our students get really early on. And some of the challenges we have in our society around stereotypical uh, descriptions of our technical fields. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, means that we, when, for example, academia and others, need to be communicating that diversity and breadth of career options and to really demystify that you know, you know, uh, kind of stereotypical things. Uh, just to relate to an example of my daughter, you know, early on I could see that she's mm -hmm. very deeply turned on by the IT and digital part of it. But at any time, she wouldn't actively consider a computing or software engineering career path because it is not considered as a cool at high school. Suddenly, as the VCU decisions came, she herself decided to do software engineering and doing well. But that, that really made me to think because she couldn't openly talk about what may be her passionate interest at school because the school didn't provide that safe environment. So we're talking about diversity and we're talking about women not being part in you know, equality in STEM, really at the you know, uh, supply end, we need to really address that career options and teachers being able to openly talk about depth and breadth of the STEM, what that, that offers in outside. Thank you. Junie? Yeah, a couple of points. Um, in addition to Katrina's um, talking about teachers, the other um, uh, demographic is parents um, who are so influential on, on their children, um, especially when they're younger. And I think what we have now is kind of generations in this country where uh, STEM has not been appreciated for, for the uh, value that it's delivered to the country. And uh, I also agree about the, the lack of understanding about different career pathways. Um, you know, working in the resources sector, we have um, double um, the, the issues, I guess, in terms of the reputation of, of the sector. 
and uh, young people now um, having very strong values and it's about aligning those values to, to our sector and saying, well, you know, we need the best, the smartest, the brightest to help us solve these, uh, these issues to decarbonise our, our planet and uh, to deliver social value to our communities. And um, even for me, my journey over the last five or six years into ESG has really opened my eyes into that social science is a science. Mm -hmm. So as an engineer, sometimes you can discount the, the science involved in um, some of those community-based um, activities that go on. Uh, at the other end of the spectrum, uh, most recently, uh, I'm involved in the, uh, with the Andy Thomas Space Centre. Now, they, are, they have students falling over themselves because they want a career in space. So trying to actually link that and say, well, OK, uh, if we're going to be involved in off-Earth construction or off-Earth extraction of resources, um, you need to know how to do that terrestrially. So, you know, they're the same skills, you know, drones, robotics, AI, machine learning, all the same skills. Thank you. Nasa? Um, uh, thank you, Mark. Um, this, is, uh, this is a problem that we have been grappling with for a very long time, especially being head of school. Uh, it's at the core of the sort of um, things that we are trying to do to, to generate business. Um, a number of factors. This is a multifaceted uh, issue. Um, working with high schools is absolutely at the core of the, uh, how we can raise the profile, awareness. Um, teachers were mentioned that they need to be qualified. We need to help teachers with the content. They just simply don't have the time. So creating modules that they can use um, in, in their curriculum uh, is essential. It is absolutely critical that we uh, deal with students at all levels. Primary students and pre-primary are uh, really critical. Uh, in addition to working uh, with um, high schools, it is absolutely critical that we we take care of the students that we have currently so that we, we provide them with the quality education so that they go and become leaders and contribute to the society that we can showcase them in high schools. There are many other factors. Uh, politicians play an important role in raising the uh, profile of the engineers and media as well. Um, we see um, programs like Discovery, Science, and so forth promoting these areas, mega structures. Uh, Hollywood plays an important role. A deep impact has created a lot of interest in astrophysics being heroes, mm -hmm. and it would be good if we have an engineering hero as well. So that we need to talk to Hollywood on this. Brian, head of civil engineering, eight kilometres from the one next to you. That's right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So look, I mean, obviously, we're tackling this, trying to tackle this problem. I don't think we've achieved uh, solving it, but uh, for the last 20 years. Um, actually, we had an interesting discussion over lunch. In fact, NASA and I were actually talking to Hugh, and uh, we all had really good mentors, you know, maths teachers who encouraged us to work in engineering and, and, um, and uh, you know, STEM disciplines. But we understand there's this equity issue. Not every school has a really good um, maths or science teacher that can provide a guiding light for students. So I absolutely agree with um, what Katrina would say, that we, we need to have sort of a multi-range of uh, ways of being able to engage um, potential students into engineering and STEM uh, disciplines. Um, so I think uh, that's an important uh, initiative. One of the ways that we've been, I mean, you, and you, mentioned, you quite a lot rightly mentioned there's been a downturn in local interest in civil engineering. So we've been trying to sort of navel gaze at Sydney University how, how we would do that. And it relates to some of the things that Janine was saying that, you know, young, um, Students um, have you know, a lot of sort of va values. We need to tap into to those values, and rather than say promoting civil engineering or mechanical engineering, what are the potential activities that those students, when they become graduates, can be involved in? So we've started to talk um, uh, locally about how um, students can be engaged in, you know, helping to design the built environment and. Uh, look at ways to achieve net zero and decarbonisation in the materials and the, and the systems that they use. So that, that's been important. We've had a few um, examples, and I think, um, if I'm not wrong, Dick Kell is here who was very instrumental in um, a, a very important uh, program which we developed at the University of Sydney in humanitarian engineering. That really taps into the interests of you know, the values that stu students are probably trying to have a positive effect on society in their careers. So I think those issues are really important, being able to understand what the drivers are.
driving um, factors are uh, in terms of what career paths people choose. One other point I wanted to perhaps raise as well was, um, uh, I mean, when I was a student and I did my undergraduate studies at the University of New South Wales, um, we had to do, as an engineer and student, we had to actually do about an eighth of our program outside of our pet discipline, um, our own discipline. And I think it's important as well to look at the areas outside of STEM, perhaps at a university level, to maybe be able to educate those disciplines on what STEM engineering and science is all about. So, I, I mean, it's a bit provocative, but I feel that's important because if we're looking at, um, I, I saw an article in the, um, in, in the actual um, program about needing more um, scientists in, in politics, but maybe we just need to be trying to um, promote a, a deeper understanding of, of STEM throughout the whole community. Well, thanks, thanks very much, panel. I'm going to put you slightly on the spot now because we have um, four leaders actually in, in university education here and, um, and someone, for, someone from industry. And the, the, rep the report announced this morning also mentions that we need to build up STEM lifelong learning. Now, if we look at what's happening, it's across the country, and if we look at New South Wales, in the last um, six years, the number of students who've gone from high school into any form of tertiary education um, has dropped by 10%. What's happening for 2023, if you compare it to this year, um, within cities, that's gone down by, it's going, appears to be going down by about another 2%, and in regional areas, by about 7%. So what we have is a whole cohort of students who are choosing as their first move out of school not to join you. However, the nation does need these skills. And my, my question to you is how is our education sector, and given that you are the main educator post high school, going to address this issue of raising the skills of people who aren't seeing a relevance straight out of high school to go to university, but the community will ultimately need those skills? And I, I might start with NASA. <laughs> yeah, very, very good question, Mark. Um, uh, I can say about the approach that we have. So in, in our curriculum, we have a, a fair element of independent learning uh, so that um, knowledge doesn't come as a monologue from the uh, lecture. And uh, this is something that uh, can be acquired individually as well with, with some help. And, and, um, and and to embed, to instill that skill in individuals that the knowledge is not fixed and it's a continuum. Uh, also, we provide um, a vehicle for continuing education. So constantly we are offering uh, refresher courses or courses that upskill uh, individuals after a certain years of graduation and um, we have been very successful in that. Thank you. Um, Katrina. It's a big issue in South Australia. <laughs> it is, absolutely. Um, but first, I mean, I, I'm not sure I'd agree with the assumption that with students not coming straight after COVID that they don't see the relevance of university education. It may not be necessarily their highest priority right now. Um, but I think, I mean, fundamentally, the days of the three, four-year undergraduate program and the two-year postgrad program, say, 10 years later in your career, are pretty well gone. And it is very much a matter of, I think, of all of the universities of, of revisiting how we can provide faster access to shorter periods of education that are more targeted to the um, more frequent career changes and requirements for career reskilling that you're going to see across the sector. So I don't think that these students don't think that education is irrelevant, but I do think that they, they're seeing, and we're seeing a step change in people going, splitting education and workforce more throughout their careers. Tuss. Yeah, it's, it's a really interesting question and an interesting challenge for all um, Australian uh, universities. But I think uh, probably reflecting on the University of Melbourne's experience, and I think we decided to professionalise the all the professional education with the lateral entry pathway so that people with a delayed career start or a changes in their career mm -hmm. can still end up into respective professionals through lateral entry program that in some ways it very partially addresses some of that. We have seen quite a lot of people who've um, gone and did different things, both university and non-university, and then choosing different university pathways and coming to us as Master of Engineering or Master of you know, IT programs. So there is, there is some recognition in, in, in incorporating that, but I think 
we are a long way off in, in really changing the entry point into our university programs to really cater that. But I think um, at the moment, it's partially why we are not changing is also um, so far as some other universities not feeling that pressure in terms of our places are not being taken up. But I think it is a, it is a change that is happening below and it's going to get, get to us soon. So I think more flexibility in the way that we take people into our universities and then allow them other pathways, I think it is something that for all of universities to reflect on. Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, the point you made about rural is, is an important one. I think, um, and uh, to try and um, engage, because and, it's quite a big disparity, 7%. Mm -hmm. So I think, uh, yeah, and, we, and I think Katrina mentioned it before, uh, you, you can't just try and address some of these things through online media. I, I do think there's still value in, you know, visiting schools and, and, and having some sort of program. I mean, every year when we usually visit Questacon, I notice that they've got this roadshow that they have uh, that, they, that goes out to regional areas to try and promote uh, science. So, so initiatives like that would be, I think, quite important because, you know, I guess they have the ability to bring practical type activities to a, to a region. Um, you could tee that up with a number of regional schools. Um, so I think a combination of uh, both physical, uh, online type activities. Uh, for, for example, uh, I was just talking to NASA over lunch that uh, um, every year we have a Roderick lecture which is named after the previous head of school and it's to actually engage on a, a, a particular issue which is topical and tomorrow's lecture is about you know, um, the, um, the cl climate change issues so we've actually got uh, a guest speaker from CSIRO and we normally open that up to all of our industry partners and um, also all of our current graduate, undergraduate cohort. But we really need to be opening up that type of event, which is quite a, a layperson event, but it's really quite topical and could really engage and um, uh, you know, really get students interested in, in careers in STEM to, to a broader public. And, you know, rural schools and you know, anyone who really wants to subscribe to it, because you know it's 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 limitless if if you've got a, a Zoom uh, meeting, uh, Billy. So yeah, I think it's, it's got to be a, a range of activities, and uh, um, you know I think the the flexible entry is, is always a, a, a an important one. One one thing we're dealing with at the moment, and you may have seen that in the media, that the our current vice chancellor is talk again talking about equity that students perhaps from um, Different, uh, perhaps schools which don't perform quite in, in the same way as you know the, the better performing schools. That there's an inequity in terms of ATAR scores, and you know, we're now starting to look at that as an opportunity to maybe engage a broader cross section of students as entry points to the University of Sydney. And you know, obviously, that could be applied to any any university. I do remember in a, in a previous role looking at the, um, the entry point of the programs that I was looking after and realising that there were 400 schools in New South Wales where the ducks wouldn't even get in. Um, mm, mm, yeah. <laughs> which, so, I mean, it's a, yeah, it's a, yeah, it's a, yeah. it's a good point. Um, Janine, I've, I've left you to the end because you work in the resources sector. You've spent a lot of time closely with Oz IMM, yes. who's very involved in reskilling a workforce as, as things change. And I was wondering if you had a, a comment on the, the lifelong learning but with the STEM focus. Yeah, the, the lifelong learning, the continual professional development is, is a huge one. Uh, and um, it's about um, people being uh, qualified, uh, being competent, but being current. And currency is, is the important one, especially in this uh, world we live in with technologies constantly changing and evolving. So any of those things that can be done to, to upskill, uh, to reskill, um, there's a lot of overlap between the resources sector, defence, um, advanced manufacturing, agriculture, there's a lot of sort of crossover skills there and different pathways. Um, another point I would make, the resources sector is um, most often in rural and remote communities. Uh, and we do have a, a fairly good track record when it comes to employing um, Indigenous people in our operations. However, they are generally not at the professional or managerial level and I think that is just a huge untapped resource for us to look at why are Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children not 
coming into um, STEM courses. I think there's a big, big disparity there. Uh, but um, yeah, I think um, the, the importance of, of lifelong learning just cannot be overestimated. I think uh, every day that goes by, I try and you know, pick up a new skill and I, I've been saying recently that I wish I could just go back 35 years and be starting again because there are so many opportunities for young people now that just did not exist, uh, especially for um, a young girl from Queensland country town. Uh, and I did go to one of those all girls schools where I had to actually have the curriculum changed so that I could actually do maths one, maths two, physics, science, chemistry, uh, physics, biology, chemistry, and English. Uh, so, because no one had ever wanted to do all of those together. So, <laughs> well done. We pleased you, we're pleased you did. <laughs> um, I promised the panel that we'd leave plenty of time for, for questions from the audience, and I'll start with one that's come through online. And we have some roving mics, so when we finish this question, I'm ready to, to put up your hand and um, take the microphone. The, the question which I thought I would, we'd start with from that have come in is the following from Tom Carruthers. I'm interested in the panel's view on the importance or role of education adjacent institutions like Questacon in terms of inspiring, engaging students into the STEM workforce. I'll kick off with you, Janine. Uh, I don't actually know much about uh, Questacon, but I think there is a big role uh, for you know, non-traditional mm. um, learning centres uh, and things like uh, the micro-credentialing, which we've kind of touched on a little bit, and uh, you know, bite-sized chunks of, of, um, of things that can be offered there. Um, and another thing that I, I neglected to say earlier was um, the importance of having industry involved in the academic courses as well, and I think that has dropped off a lot in the last 30 years. Uh, actually having guest lecturers coming in um, and uh, also then the crossover to that being the vacation work that's being offered. Um, certainly in the resources sector, companies uh, like Mount Isa Mines that used to offer amazing uh, undergrad and graduate programs has just gone by the wayside. So I think, you know, it comes back to this cooperation between uh, industry, academia and, and of course government as well to, to have the right policy settings. Katrina, do you want to make a comment on that? I want to answer both of those questions. Actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I find that really interesting because we're seeing such demand from our students for internships. Um, all of our students, yeah. all of our engineering students will do internships. So, and we're seeing a, a really strong push from our students to have mm. more industry speakers as well. So it's interesting that we're mm. perhaps not tapping into all the segments that we need to, particularly when we have such a, a gap in, in the supply. I think there, there is a real disconnect there. Yeah. Uh, there are people screaming with their arms up saying, we'd love to come and, and yeah. uh, be guest lecturers. So. Yeah. Um, but to answer the question, I guess, around Questacon, um, I mean, I, I'm a massive fan of groups like that. Uh, they do such an amazing job of, of bringing new ideas and new inspiration through to schools, particularly going out into schools. Um, what I think is really important, and particularly about groups like Questacon in particular, is that they're sustained. It's not just a one-off professional development opportunity that teachers go to and they don't get the chance to reflect on and embed and build into their practice, they can go to groups like Questacon consistently and have that sustained development. So I think I'm a massive fan of those education adjacent, if that's the terminology that, we, that they use, um, but I really think that it's the sustained ones that we need to double down on our investment for. Thank you. We might go to the, go to the floor. We might come back to that, but for the moment we'll go to the floor. We have a, a question over here. Um, hello, my name is Cynthia Nolan and I work with a lot of uh, secondary schools in Brisbane and I'm, I'm going to ask the same question I asked this morning at the breakfast because it didn't get answered at the breakfast um, and a few colleagues mentioned that as well at lunch which is, um, so I work greatly with parents um, and career advisors within secondary and there are a lot of different reasons why students don't necessarily take um, certain subjects such as tech digital solutions or engineering um, at the higher end of secondary and, and how that translates then for further education. And uh, two of these things is um, how subjects scale within ATAR and you know, the, the scaling um, and also the, the issue around 
um, assumed knowledge. And if you are going to study, um, say, computer science or any of these you know, wonderful subjects, um, at no point is there any discussion that you need to or have an assumed knowledge of either engineering or um, some sort of digital technologies, digital solutions. And there's not even a, a whisper of uh, getting credit against some of this. Um, now, as myself a teacher, I know what we cover, um, and I know that's very much first university computer science. It, you know, we're covering similar material. Um, and I, I want to, to sort of ask you, since we have such amazing university representation, is there ever going to be a situation where we we'll either scrap assumed knowledge completely or we include assumed knowledge being secondary digital solutions type knowledge? Do you want to kick us off on that one, Brian? Uh, yeah, I think um, it's a really good question. I mean, I wasn't at the breakfast, but uh, um, the, in terms of, I mean, all the universities I've worked, and I've worked at a number, uh, you know, we have, there's been a scaling back of sort of assumed knowledge. We've actually reintroduced that at Sydney in terms of mathematics. I think there's various reasons for that. Um, but uh, I, I think it depends on, on, on the particular subject uh, involved. Um, uh, and I, I guess there, there, there are opportunities there. I mean, we, we've had various programs at other universities where students that have come in with really, really high scoring in particular areas where they can have an accelerated program. That's not for all. Um, is that the type of uh, thing that you're talking about or are you talking about something right across the, the board? I'm really talking about how, um, where, when students are choosing what to study in high, in sort of secondary, yeah. um, they uh, are saying, well, I can do computing science and I don't need to study it at I secondary see. because yeah, it's yeah. not a, a prerequisite. Yeah. Um, and so what that means is that you will have less students in the pipeline who will study it because they've not been exposed to it at that earlier stage. Yeah, yeah. Okay. No, I do get your point. Yeah, did you want to... Yeah, can I yeah, yeah. Um, it's an exceptionally good question, and we have observed this um, type of advice. And essentially, in any fine-tuned system, um, if you change certain parameters, sometimes you, you end up with uh, unintended consequences. Mm -hmm. For example, uh, universities 10 years ago uh, dropped, at least in engineering, uh, prerequisite for mathematics, high-level mathematics. This was, uh, the intention was to make the uh, sort of uh, STEM subject more accessible, even for those students who haven't done it. But the, the, the end result of this was that, and also coupled with the fact that students now um, ranked based on how many top band um, sort of scores that they have, uh, this has led um, career advisors, for example, if, if a person can do even three unit math, they encourage them to do two unit math because they will get a higher score, and the school will be represented uh, in, in a uh, reasonable. And, and, and also, they give typically the wrong advice that if you do a two unit math and you score a higher mark, it is better for your ATAR, which is not the case because the top, um, more challenging subjects are dramatically scaled and influence the ATAR positively. So, it's a consequence of a number of aspects uh, that it is leading to type of. Uh, advice that uh, you have witnessed or observed. Thomas? Yeah, I think it is a complex trade-off uh, between flexibility and accessibility of programs. So we've, um, at University of Melbourne, because of the flexible um, career paths and choices, we've removed a lot of the assumed knowledge in most of the programs. So there's a very minimal assumed knowledge they need in order to enter it because the course itself, they can wire up that knowledge in order to accelerate. But of course, those who are actually taken the subjects will actually get a head start and they can actually explore other things within the university. So it actually enriches their university. So it's really a conversation about what the students are seeking to do and how are we going to do it. So I understand, yeah, actually, we would love to know who is actually taking these subjects so we can actually predict where the demand is going to come in and who the, where to target our messaging. But a lot of the consultation is about students want to retain that flexibility of choice uh, as they come into the university to move into different programs. So by having a lot of uh, you know, assumed knowledge to enter into specific programs, that actually blocks then students who later discover they wanted to pursue those things. So it is a, a bit of a trade-off between 
you know, the, uh, making professional programs more accessible to much more, uh, number, you know, different number of students versus building in an assumed knowledge so that it is open to people who have pursued that, you know, before coming to the university. But what it is, I think, the students who want to do it, I think we need to be encouraging them because they actually then get a head start. They have other options within the university to pursue because I think universities, there are really great array of options and passions for them to pursue, not just one um, STEM. I think one of the things I would like to say, it is not just STEM at universities, it should be STEM plus. And what is that plus actually will define what their career path is going to be. And that we could, you know, talk about lots of different plus things that we can build, whether it's a STEM and interdisciplinarity, or is there STEM and innovation and entrepreneurship, or is it STEM and, uh, you know, arts or communications and other things. It's really the STEM plus actually going to give you the edge in the career pathways. So if people not have done earlier STEM subjects, that actually allows them to accelerate within the university or gives them more options, actually then they can actually be better prepared to face university things. And I think that is how we should be encouraging students to take more subjects which actually you know, aligns with their kind of at least rough estimate where their interest lies. Um, but the universities, most of the universities now geared for that flexibility and accessibility and so that we don't want to block away pathways for future students. Mm -hmm. Do you feel you got an answer? <laughs> a lot closer, yes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> we can work at it. We'll chat, we'll yes. chat. Yeah, we might, that's what we might just, okay. sure. we've got a few questions. Uh, um, so, George, oh sorry, oh sorry, up here, yep, thank you. <laughs> Hi, my name is Jai Strawn, I'm from the Resources Division at the Department of Industry Science and Resources. Um, my question is pretty short. Towards the start of this panel, we were talking about the need to change the narrative, I suppose, around STEM skills, STEM education. Um, my background coming from the resources industry, perhaps this question is most directed at Janine, but what is the panel's thoughts on the most problematic aspects of that narrative and where the greatest opportunities for us to change um, the topics that we communicate? Uh, what, what are those greatest opportunities, I suppose? Thanks. Kick us off. I might Sorry, Janine, dive yes. in. Um, language is really, really important. So you hear um, the mining industry is doing this. The mining industry is, you know, uh, we need to change that word. Firstly, because we're the resources sector, um, and we're extracting materials and re resources to sustain our planet. Um, so that's really important. Um, and, you know, the media, as they do, are looking for headlines, so they're always looking for the bad stories to tell whenever something goes wrong. And every time that happens, it sets us back, you know, a, a long way and we have to gain, regain that trust. Uh, and I think that's the single most important thing for, for the resources sector, but all um, engineers and scientists, is having that trust. And I think we saw some leaps and bounds in that during COVID where people were starting to trust scientists, but there are, you know, that's kind of dropped off again. So um, yeah, we definitely need to change the way everybody speaks uh, about the work that we do. Katrina, do you wanna answer that one? Yeah, it's um, changing the narrative, I think is a really difficult issue though, um, I think, We've, we've had that conversation at various points, particularly with prospective students and families. And I think there's a, probably a healthy degree of cynicism around attempts to try and change that narrative. So I think we need, to, it's actually quite, um, quite a difficult issue. I think we need to be a lot more uh, advanced in our thinking of, it, of how best to do that. Thank you. Um. Hi, um, thanks. James Venetakis from the Forest Research Foundation. Um, fantastic panel. First, a comment. Great to have uh, guest lecturers coming in and presenting, but don't just invite them in without spending time briefing them what the subject's about, what part of the story they're heading into. It actually can be counterproductive. And it's also a burden on the guest lecturer to come in and see students falling asleep because you're thinking you should be talking about A and they're thinking they should be learning about X. Um, so it's not an easy cop-out to just give an hour up. Uh, it's, just, it's, really, it's, it's a really important point and it's something I hammered uh, hard, really close to the academics I work with. My question is, 
a lot of really uh, exciting discussions about the curriculum and 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 so on, and you know, making the curriculum you know STEM plus and so on. But the curriculum is so overpacked, right? It's you know we expect there's just so much facts that we don't get the time for that plus. Um, and I'm a sociologist. I'm not a uh, I'm not a STEM person, and I kind of tried to make my I tried to include STEM into my sociology degree, um, but that meant I had to rip out a whole bunch of classical sociology stuff, you know, and I got massive pushback from the sociologists in my in my in my in my, my colleagues. So what what where's the balance? Like, what can we afford to drop as educators to make sure that it's not just about learning the facts, but about curiosity, creativity? Um, you know, uh, joy. You know, joy should be a learning attribute, a learning outcome for our students. So, what do we, what do we rip out, and and how do we then deal with professional organisations um, to, to to so they don't go, well, you're going to get a black mark against your name for not including all this technical technical stuff. That's no, Wonderful observations, uh, great question. Um, I, I should comment that um, having an invited lecture from industry is not uh, to escape um, sort of lecturing. Uh, it has to be fully integrated into the course and um, wonderful suggestion. And we try to adhere to that to the extent possible, but I, I hear uh, the problems that you have indicated. Um, in, in curriculum being packed, and introducing new uh, sort of relevant topics. This is something that we grapple with all the time. And uh, it is like old days uh, when we're getting rid of a slide rule and trying to introduce new topics. I, I'm sure that similar arguments were um, posed. But uh, we are all the time, for example, we're going through a major curriculum review in my school. And uh, we are trying to desperately to see which, which component can be sort of lowered in terms of exposure and leave it to independent learning and what new areas like AI, machine learning, and digital literacy be introduced, which is absolutely critical in every element of. So these are uh, the questions that you had, the um, problems that you have identified we are grappling with and we are trying to find a solution for. Brian, you also have the same challenges. <laughs> Yeah, look, I, I mean, it's, it's always a question because, you know, many of us have to also um, go through the process of having accreditation from, you know, bodies like Engineers Australia and, you know, Australian Computing Society and all of those things. So I guess um, we take our lead uh, very much also from our industry advisory bodies. So we do have a very close um, engagement with them and we try and pick up on the trends that uh, they're seeing in their organisation that they feel graduates should be prepared for. So, you know, it's, it's that gradual um, development of the program, which NASA was talking about, I and mean, we're currently going through that at the moment at the University of Sydney with some um, digital uh, aspects. And we're looking at what we've been doing is, is not just sort of putting in you know, digital literacy 101, for example. We've been doing a stock take across all of our uh, undergraduate programs in each of the disciplines and looking at the various aspects, you know, where statistics is taught, you know, where computing and all of those aspects. And then, then we're try, trying to find out where the gaps are. And so that, that's, a, that's a big effort, but then it, it then may, means that when we get to the end of that, probably the changes that we need to make in the curriculum aren't as big as they may have already, uh, as they may have appeared when we, when we started. Hello. So um, that, that's um, the way we've been approaching it, for example. Um, but it's so, going to do this with everyone. We just start talking shit and everyone. Yeah. Hearing that. I'm going to, everyone I talk to, I'm going to do an interview. Sorry. Lucky my name is Remy. <laughs> <Yeah>. Listen, um, <laughs> I think we've got our, we've got our, our chair here has, 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 has risen. And I think that's a, I think that's a signal. Um, would you, it's been a wonderful discussion. I've been really impressed with this panel. Could you please give a, a big round of applause and thank you. Thank you.